Now I want to talk about practical strategies for reducing our exposure to microplastics and their associated chemicals. And let's start with water. The most straightforward action is to minimize drinking water from plastic bottles and cans. Plastic bottles can leach microplastic and chemicals like BPA and BPS into water, and cans are often lined with plastic coatings containing these substances. But even if you're opting for water in glass bottles, there's another layer to consider, and that is the quality of the water itself is especially when it comes to carbonated water. This is where the forever chemicals enter. These are the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS. As we discussed earlier, they are referred to forever chemicals. They are particularly troubling because they have half-lives that are several years long, meaning they persist in the body and accumulate over time. So PFAS have been linked to a range of health issues, including hormonal disruptions, immune system effects, even certain cancers. In 2020, Consumer Reports conducted third-party testing, and they published data on several popular brands of sparkling water to measure PFAS levels. The findings were eye-opening. Topo Chico topped the list with PFAS levels at 9.76 parts per trillion. To put that into perspective, Perrier registered at about 1.1 part per trillion, and San Pellegrino, which was even lower, at 0.31 part per trillion. Both Perrier and San Pellegrino are often available in glass bottles, which is an added advantage for reducing plastic exposure. And I do think it's encouraging that multiple brands did achieve PFAS levels below one part per trillion, which demonstrates that it's entirely feasible to provide safer options. But this raises a critical question. Why do some brands like Topo Chico have such high levels of PFAS? In 2023, Coca-Cola, which is the parent company of Topo Chico, claimed they had reduced their PFAS levels by about half. However, without any actual transparent empirical data to confirm this, and even if it was accurate, that would still leave their PFAS levels at around 4.88 parts per trillion, which is significantly higher than many other brands that have less than one part per trillion of PFAS levels in their sparkling waters. So I think this situation does underscore a very important point, which is that we can't always rely on bottled or canned water, even from brands we trust, to be free of contaminants. So how do we ensure that the water we're consuming is safe? I think the answer lies in taking control of our water quality at home. And one of the most effective ways to do this is by installing a reverse osmosis filtration system. So reverse osmosis filters can remove up to 99.9% of microplastic particles from water. It's really one of the best solutions for obtaining clean drinking water. Beyond microplastics, these systems also filter out a wide range of contaminants, everything from heavy metals to bacteria, and even chemicals like BPA and the PFAS forever chemicals. Now, it is important to note that reverse osmosis filters don't just remove the bad. They also strip away beneficial minerals and trace elements. So this is everything from calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, phosphorus, a variety of others, zinc, iron, copper, and selenium, iodine, manganese, and on and on. There's more. Um, These minerals are essential for various functions in the body, obviously everything from bone health to nerve signaling, but there are practical solutions to this issue. Many reverse osmosis systems now come with a remineralization filter option that can add back these essential minerals and trace elements back to the water after they're purified. Alternatively, there's high quality mineral drops that can be added back to the filtered water or people can just supplement with mineral supplements. I do think that an added benefit of having a reverse osmosis home filtration system is its versatility because not only can you use this water for drinking, but you can use the purified water to wash fruits and vegetables and a variety of produce, which can be contaminated with microplastics on their surface from soil, from contaminated water, from air exposure, where these particles settle on the surface of the produce. So washing produce with Filtered water can help remove some of these microplastic particles that cling to surfaces, particularly waxy surfaces on certain produce. When it comes to food, opting for fresh over packaged food is another obvious impactful choice. So packaged foods often come wrapped in plastic. Those can shed microplastic and leach chemicals like BPA into our food. So by choosing fresh produce, fresh meats, bulk items, we can minimize the exposure, which is good for our own health, but also promotes environmental health as well. Similarly, we should consider reducing our consumption of canned foods and canned beverages. So many aluminum cans are lined with plastic coatings. These coatings contain BPA 
or they have alternatives like BPS, which carry similar health risks. So whenever possible, it's better to select products that are packaged in glass versus cans. We can also reevaluate our food storage habits. So opting for glass or stainless steel or ceramic containers instead of plastic ones. Avoid heating food in plastic containers. Remember heat can accelerate the leaching of chemicals like BPA into our food, into our beverages. It also accelerates the oxidation process, which then causes more microplastics to be shed from the larger plastic itself. And remember, microwave safe simply means the plastic won't melt. It doesn't guarantee that it's free from chemical leaching. Also try to avoid cooking with nonstick pans, which are coated with some of these chemicals like the forever chemicals. So try to opt for options like titanium, ceramic, um, cast iron. These are all other options that we should be using for cooking our foods. Because again, heat is causing these chemicals to be leached into our foods at an even higher and accelerated rate. Um, which brings me to another crucial point, and I want to talk about this myth of BPA-free products. There's a lot of these BPA-free products which sound like they're safer alternatives, but they're not. Um, manufacturers frequently replace BPA with chemicals like BPS, which also can disrupt hormonal activity in much the same way. And studies have shown that BPS may not be a safer option than BPA and potentially causing adverse health effects on fetal development, brain health, cardiovascular function. Some BPA-free plastics even contain phthalates or other harmful plasticizers. So the term BPA-free merely means the product lacks BPA and not that it's free from all other toxic chemicals. I also want to again highlight and bring your attention to a common daily exposure to microplastics and their associated chemicals, and that is disposable paper, coffee, and teacups. These convenient paper cups are typically lined with plastic to prevent leaks. Here's the issue. When you pour that hot beverage into them, the heat causes the plastic lining to break down. You're getting microplastics into the beverage. You're leaching chemicals like BPA into your beverage at a much higher level. I already talked about a study where heat can cause the leaching of BPA up to 55 times higher compared to cold liquids. So a simple solution really is just to bring your own reusable to-go mug to a coffee shop. If you're enjoying a drink at the cafe, ask for a ceramic cup. If you're on the go, just bring your own mug. And most baristas are actually happy to fill your own travel mug. Some shops actually even offer a discount for doing so. When it comes to oral consumption of microplastics and their associated chemicals, I wanna address another hidden source of microplastics and that is salt. Um, it may or may not surprise you, but salt can significantly contribute to our microplastic intake. Estimates suggest that consuming salt can add around 7,000 microplastic particles to our diet each year. And that's a conservative figure. So sea salt generally has the highest levels of microplastic contamination due to the ocean pollution. One study found that sea salts contained anywhere from 550 to 681 microplastic particles per kilogram, making them some of the most contaminated sources of salt. Lake salts come next, followed by rock salts, which have the least amount of microplastic contamination. So rock salts include commonly used varieties like Morton's iodized salt or pink Himalayan salt. So these salts do still contain some microplastics, but the levels are significantly lower than what's found in sea salts. So whenever possible, opting for rock or mined salts can reduce microplastic intake. Okay, now let's turn our attention to the air we breathe. This is another significant yet often overlooked source of microplastic exposure. Reducing the amount of microplastics we inhale is crucial. And fortunately, there are a few practical steps that we can take to minimize this risk. First and foremost, let's consider our indoor environments. This is where we spend the majority of our time. One effective strategy is to use a HEPA filter. This is a high efficiency particulate air filter. Using these in our homes can be highly efficient at trapping airborne microplastic particles. They can capture particles as small as 0.3 microns, making them pretty suitable for removing the vast majority of microplastics found in indoor air, many of which range from 10 to 100 microns in size. A significant portion of airborne microplastics originates from synthetic textiles, from carpets, and other household materials. Every time we walk across a synthetic carpet or we sit on a polyester couch, 
tiny plastic fibers can become airborne. By using a HEPA filter, especially in areas where synthetic materials are prevalent, we can significantly reduce the number of microplastics floating around in our indoor air. Moreover, many modern vacuum cleaners actually now come equipped with a HEPA filter. So this feature allows them to trap microplastics effectively when they're cleaning floors or carpets, and it prevents these particles from being redistributed back into the air. So regular vacuuming with HEPA filters can also make a substantial difference and indoor air quality as well. Now let's address the source of many of these airborne microplastics, our clothing. Synthetic fibers like polyester, nylon, and acrylic are ubiquitous in today's fashion. Um, these materials offer benefits like durability and affordability, but they also shed microplastics into the environment, both into the air and also through washing. One impactful change is to opt for clothing made from 100% natural fibers. So this is cotton, bamboo, linen, hemp, wool, or silk. These materials do not shed microplastics. But it is important to note that even blends containing synthetic fibers can still release microplastics. So aiming for pure natural fibers is really key here. I understand this might be challenging, especially for people that have specific fashion preferences or budget considerations, but even gradual shifts in our wardrobe can make a significant difference over time. For those of us not ready to 100% part with our synthetic garments, there are ways we can also still mitigate the impact. Installing a microfiber filter on our washing machine is an effective method. So washing Synthetic clothes is a major, major source of microplastic pollution in the ocean, in our waters. And so installing a microplastic filter can actually trap microplastic fibers released during washing of our laundry and prevent them from entering our waterways. There's also brands like Guppy Friend that offer these laundry bags that are designed to catch microfibers during washing. So these bags really offer a straightforward and cost-effective solution for people that are not really ready to install a microfiber filter on their washing machine just yet. I also wanna highlight another pathway through which microplastics and their associated chemicals like BPA can enter our bodies and that is through the skin. So dermal absorption isn't as significant as ingesting contaminated food or water or inhaling polluted air, but it is still a route worth paying attention to, especially because it involves everyday items we might not suspect. So consider thermal paper receipts. These are things that we're getting from the supermarkets, gas stations, ATMs. These receipts often contain BPA, which is used as a color developer in the thermal printing process. So when we handle receipts, BPA can transfer into our skin and potentially enter our bloodstream. Now here's where it gets more interesting and concerning is that the use of lotions or sunscreens or hand sanitizers can dramatically increase the absorption of BPA through the skin. These products can enhance our skin's permeability, which allows BPA to pass through the skin more so than it normally would. In fact, studies have shown that using hand sanitizer before handling receipts can significantly boost BPA absorption into our bloodstream. So what can we do about this? When possible, opt to decline paper receipts or request a digital version, have it sent to your email or phone. Many retailers offer this option and it reduces BPA exposure to ourselves, but it also reduces paper waste, so it's a win-win. Um, if your job requires you handling receipts frequently, such as if you're in a retail or food service, consider wearing nitrile gloves. So nitrile gloves are effective barriers against chemicals like BPA, unlike some latex glove, which may not offer the same level of protection. 